Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Steve Lewis, and I'm a Senior Director of RISTEC based in the UK. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, and welcome to this RISTEC webinar, uh, which is the third of Series 7. Now, we regularly ask you what topics you'd like us to cover, uh, and as a result, we'll be presenting on four of the most popular requests. Uh, the subject of today's webinar is about bringing hydrogen to life safely. Hopefully we can provide some useful and practical insights for you. Uh, now the webinar is going to take about an hour with 45 minutes for the presentation. Uh, we should leave about 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, we've muted everybody so the sound won't be distorted by any background noise. And if you'd like to ask questions, uh, and we do encourage uh, you to ask questions, then uh, we're going to use the Q&A function in Zoom, which you, if you're not familiar with that, if you just pull your cursor down to the bottom of the page, the, the, uh, the ribbon comes up at the bottom, just click on those little speech bubbles, say Q&A, type your question in. Uh, I'll keep track of the questions uh, and we're aiming to cover as many as we can at the end of the session and within the hour that we have available. Okay, uh, I'd now like to briefly introduce RISTEC to those of you who don't know us. I'll be pretty quick. Um, what we do is we help clients to manage health, safety, security, environmental and business risk in sectors where the impact of loss is high. Uh, we do that through five uh, business lines. So that's consulting, uh, learning, which involves online and classroom training, postgraduate education, uh, result, resourcing, uh, which involves providing associates to work at client locations, uh, industrial and vendor inspections, and also uh, research and development in the field of risk and safety management. Okay, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce today's presenter, Nick Taylor. Uh, Nick is a principal consultant in risk management and system safety engineering. Uh, he's based in our Derby office in the UK. Uh, he's got a pretty broad engineering background uh, with specific expertise in control systems uh, and the hydrogen economy. Uh, so that experience, that's about 20 years uh, engineering experience, uh, which includes periods in design, commissioning and third party assessment. And that's across a range of sectors, including marine power, industrial control systems, rail defense, and then over the last few years, uh, hydrogen systems. Uh, Nick uh, currently provides risk and safety engineering input into TV Rhineland's global hydrogen center of competence. Okay, Nick, over to you. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you, Steve, for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, like Steve says, I'm going to be uh, talking today uh, about uh, the hydrogen economy, uh, how far it is going to come into our lives, or the, certainly the potential for how far it could come into our lives, uh, and the change in risk profile that that uh, presents uh, to, uh, to the general population. Okay, so yeah, but we'll, we'll be looking at uh, the, the the range and what what the hydrogen opportunity looks like. So from uh, producers uh, right the way through to the, the consumers, uh, we'll be looking at the properties of hydrogen, what makes it unique, and how how does it change the risk profile? Uh, and we've got a small comparison to um, other gases such as natural gas. Uh, no, no safety related uh, presentation uh, is complete without some recognition of the uh, past hydrogen accidents. Uh, so we've got uh, just a few examples. I, I don't go into detail on that, but, but we, we have to mention those to, to really frame the, uh, the, the problem that we're, that we're facing. Uh, I, I'm gonna go on and, and talk about cl classic risk management techniques uh, and how other high hazard industries uh, manage their risk to uh, acceptable levels. Um, what, what we see uh, is, is a lot of people from high hazard industries becoming involved in the hydrogen economy and in hydrogen systems, uh, but also we see people from other industries where perhaps the management of uh, safety risk and safety hazards uh, is not part of the tacit knowledge set. And so it's, it's important to just mention uh, and do a few examples on how risk is managed in industry. Uh, but beyond that, uh, recognizing that the process is all very well, 
Uh, but, but really, what, what sort of things do you need to know about or what kind of questions do you have to ask of your design in order to reduce risk to acceptable levels? Uh, and, and then we wrap up with a, with a small conclusion. OK, so you, you see a, a few nice pictures there. Uh, what, what I've tried to do there is, is really show the range of um, products uh, where hydrogen may become involved. So uh, the, the top there, uh, hydrogen motorbike, uh, fantastic invention. Uh, certainly that's a, that's a few years old now. I think that might be a patent uh, from Honda. I, I'm not sure, uh, but, but certainly th th that's a potential application. Uh, on the right uh, is something that, that may be recognizable to people in the UK as a, a domestic boiler. Uh, this is where we, we'll get our hot water from in our houses. So hydrogen could come to your house. And at the bottom there, that, this is a laptop. Uh, and you can tell just by looking at it that, the, that that's quite an old design of laptop. Uh, certainly that's, uh, that's a decade or so old. Um, but uh, there is, is even a concept to have a hydrogen powered laptop. So you know, that, that, that seems like a, a fairly good and maybe potentially unexpected range of applications of hydrogen technology. Okay, so <clears throat> talked and um, briefly mentioned the, the scale of the hydrogen opportunity. Uh, and, and I call it that because uh, any business um, looks at opportunity uh, and where that opportunity may present itself for their activities. Uh, and this particular graphic, uh, I, I think, shows quite nicely um, the, the scale. So, so over to the left, we have uh, renewable energy type sources. So off, offshore wind, wave, wave power, um, solar, solar panels, uh, and also uh, nuclear, uh, all providing electricity into this thing called an electrolyzer. Uh, and, and your electrolyzer could, could take a few different, uh, different forms and a few technologies, uh, but, but that, that's, a, that's a thing which is uh, unique to the production of hydrogen, certainly in the context of this discussion. Okay, and then, and then down here, uh, we have uh, other sources of energy. So uh, natural gas, uh, there, there could be traditional, uh, traditional forms, uh, coal and, and such, such stuff, bio, biogas uh, and renewable natural gas for export, for example. Uh, but, but ultimately they, they provide um, alternative sources of hydrogen uh, into the distribution network. So just, just going back a bit, the, we've got an electrolyzer producing, uh, uh, taking electricity, producing hydrogen. Uh, we've got pyrolysis, we've got methane reforming, um, and we've got uh, biogas and hydrogen blending. So there's this, this idea to, uh, to blend hydrogen into existing distribution networks. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that perhaps uh, as the presentation goes on. So, so what, once we've created it, uh, and once all those businesses who are involved in the creation of it uh, have uh, have done their uh, done their thing, uh, and it's in the pipes, then it goes off to the right. We we, we can export it. Uh, we can store it in a geological sense underground or using industrial means. Uh, and and what you know, or if we don't want to store it, then we can we can continue to use it. And we see this uh, this decision point here where we can. Uh, use uh, something like, well, an electrolyzer in reverse to convert hydrogen back to electricity to, to meet peak demand, uh, for example. Uh, we can also take it on and use it in our domestic homes uh, for, uh, for heating, uh, use it for cooking, uh, and you know, we, we could use it on a small scale for power. So th this, this, this is the, the far right consumer end, which is our life. And of course, if you work over here, that's part of your life as well. Hence the title um, of the webinar. And um, when we see down here further uses, which are uh, for transportation. So uh, we're already seeing hydrogen trains uh, in various countries. Uh, hydrogen cars uh, are, are not a new thing by any stretch. Uh, hydrogen uh, vans, lorries, buses, uh, hydrogen ferries, uh, and also hydrogen planes. So uh, you, you could probably put yourself uh, and your business in any location. Uh, on that diagram. So hopefully that, that gives some good context as to, uh, as to where your operations sit in the grand scheme of things.
Okay, so so what what are the uh, what are the physical properties of this uh, fantastic new uh, new <laughs> fuel, which isn't new at all? Uh, we've been using hydrogen in industry for cent- uh, a decade, if not a century or more. Okay, so it's, it's not it's not a new thing, but it is seeing new applications. Okay, so hydrogen is the the the, the lightest element in the known universe, um, which is a good thing. Okay, from a safety point of view, it, it's a good thing because it disperses uh, quite easily. It's the, it's the small, it's the lightest element because it is the smallest molecular size. Uh, but what that does mean is that it has a propensity to leak far greater than other uh, gases used uh, in industry. So it, it leaks 50 times more than water, 10 times more than nitrogen, and five times more than propane, and three times more than natural gas. So, so when, when we talk about uh, using existing infrastructure, really, we have to think about the uh, additional leak uh, in terms of the design uh, of the infrastructure we're intending to use. Okay. Uh, other, other properties, the hydrogen, uh, the, the molecular size means that uh, it's so small it can permeate through material. Basically, it gets uh, in amongst the uh, the its host material uh, and and can seep through to the outside, which is bad, and we'll and we'll see why soon. Uh, it diffuses into the metal, and, and as a result, there's this phenomena of hydrogen embrittlement, okay, which can lead to uh, obviously a catastrophic failure if undetected. Um, so, what we have to accept is that if you have hydrogen in your operation, then it is going to leak. It is going to come out and we have to be sure that we can handle that in the right way because uh, it's colorless and odorless at ambient temperatures. Okay, so it's it's gonna come out, but we can't see it and we can't smell it. So there's clearly a, a change in risk profile there. So let's think about what happens once it's out of the, out of the box, if you like. Um, once it's ignited, uh, the, the flame is invisible. So uh, not only can you not see it when it's before it's burnt, you can't smell it, but also you can't see it even if it is burnt. Uh, and also, uh, unless you're touching the flame already, um, then you can't feel it because the radiant heat from that flame is very low as well, although the flame is very hot. So perhaps these bullets are slightly in the wrong order because the ignition energy required to ignite released hydrogen is very low. Okay, so 0.017 millijoules, that, that is considerably lower uh, than other gases which are regularly used in industry. Okay, and that obviously has a, a bearing on some of our design choices. And again, we'll be asking about that uh, in later slides. Uh, there is a, an additional phenomenon, which is the uh, reverse Joules-Thompson effect uh, most gases uh, cool down as they expand, but in fact, hydrogen heats up instead. Uh, so if in our process uh, we, we require the hydrogen to expand, uh, then we need to control the effects of that increase in temperature. So again, more things to ask about design. Have we considered that? Okay. Uh, right. There we go. So. Yes, like I say, no, uh, no safety related set of slides is complete without a, a set, an, an example of what can go wrong. So uh, in, in Norway there, that was a hydrogen refueling station. Um, apparently, uh, no, nobody was uh, immediately killed. There, was no, there were no fatalities, uh, but I believe the, uh, the boom um, set off an airbag which sent some people to hospital. So, okay, potentially uh, not great, but the economic damage to the firm who uh, was uh, considerable. Uh, and so we, we, we need not to forget about that. Uh, and also uh, the, the reputational damage, not just to the firm, but to the uptake uh, of hydrogen as a fuel in general needs to be considered uh, when we are uh, deploying these sorts of systems. Okay, we've got an explosion in South Korea where a, a hydrogen tank exploded. I, I believe there was two fatalities there with six injuries. And uh, as you can see from the photo, although it doesn't show you a great deal, you can see the amount of destruction. Uh, and you know, we, we ought to bear these 
pictures in mind when we get to later slides uh, because there may have been design choices they could have made which would have reduced the amount of collateral damage. Uh, the, the incident here in Illinois, you can see from that overview picture that there's complete demolition of the building, uh, apparently, and sadly, um, four, four fatalities from this one with, with one only one person injured, which is amazing considering the damage done. Uh, uh, and apparently the blast was felt 30 kilometers away, which seems like quite a long way to me. Interesting thing here was that there were uh, some co-located hazardous substances. Uh, so yeah, you have to ask whether they really recognize the risks uh, associated with their hydrogen operation. Okay, so but let's try and remember those for, for later slides. Okay. So in, in high hazard industries, how, how do we actually manage risk? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make the assumption that there's some people who've uh, joined us who are from high hazard industries and there are some people who are new to high hazard industries. So uh, in, in general, uh, we, we, talk about, we talk about safety. In reality, uh, nothing is completely safe. Uh, we, we never say anything is completely safe. It is always um, acceptably safe in a given context, uh, because as the quotation there says, safety is achieved by reducing risk to a tolerable level, uh, defined as tolerable risk. And, Tolerable risk is risk that is accepted in a given context based on the current values of society. Uh, so uh, that, that basically says we have to recognize and understand what amount of risk we are prepared to accept. Okay, and how, how do we actually do that? Well, we in the, in the yellow uh, dotted box, <coughs> that, that's where I'm going to limit my conversation to, uh, but we start with uh, identifying the risk. So actually, what is the source of harm? We, uh, we, we analyze the risk to see um, what are the causes and consequences, uh, and then we uh, evaluate the risk uh, to see uh, whether our um, designs have managed it effectively. But there's a little more detail on that coming up. Okay. Right, so first one is the, the risk identification. Oh, you know, often we use risk and hazard interchangeably. In actual fact, hazard is a potential source of harm and risk is the product of severity and likelihood of the harm that may uh, arise from the hazard. So there's, there's a, a bit of a distinction, but often uh, they are used interchangeably. Um, <clears throat> when we are identifying our, our risks or, or hazards, uh, we have uh, a number of methods. They're all systematic, so they're all repeatable things that we can uh, that we can do, and we can follow a known process over again. So we've got HAZOP, which is a hazard and operability study, uh, a detailed method of assessing a system. We've got HAZIDs, which are uh, slightly slight less detailed, but but no less exhausting, uh, and, and then FMEAs, which look at the known failure modes uh, of the system under consideration. And to, to do these, we, we need inputs. Uh, we, we need a system description, so we, we need to know what the system is doing uh, down, down to functional detail or, or in reality, as much detail as is available um, written down or otherwise. Uh, we, we want to look at process and instrumentation diagrams to see what's actually there. We want to know about materials, uh, material properties, uh, and, and we need technical expertise. So. Uh, that, that, in, in order to, to do these, we need to facilitate the session, but we need to facilitate technical expertise to examine uh, and ask questions of the design in the right way. Uh, and of course, uh, maintenance expertise is essential uh, as part of this process uh, because it's maintained for a lot longer than it's designed. Okay, let's make sure that maintainers um, are involved. Okay, so what, what do we get out? Once, once we've facilitated our, our systematic uh, risk identification method, then we, we come out with a list of relevant hazards. Okay, so, so we know therefore where our potential sources of harm are uh, and what the causes of that harm may be. Okay, so that in a nutshell um, is, is how we identify risk. Uh, we, we have this process of uh, analysis uh, once we've identified it. So analysis is to comprehend the nature of the risk and its characteristics. Uh, including where appropriate the level of risk. So, so that's where the difference between hazard and risk comes in. Uh, and then, like I say, uh, 
risk is likelihood multiplied by severity. So therefore, once we've done our risk analysis, then we know uh, what our initial risk process, uh, our initial risk profile actually is. Where are the things that are going to cause us the most amount of, of harm? So we've done a risk analysis, then we evaluate our risk, then so we compare the initial risk analysis against our tolerability criteria. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into tolerability and how we define that. That's the subject of another day. And uh, you're welcome to, uh, to do some background reading. Uh, it, it's something that, that, that we can help with as a firm, uh, but uh, I think that it's, it's out of scope of this conversation. But it is there, we have to know what we're willing to tolerate. Uh, so if we have identified something uh, which presents a risk that we can't tolerate, uh, then we need to do something else. So we need to influence design and we influence design by generating safety requirements. Okay, uh, and in, in the case of, of hydrogen, what, what, we, what we have found, which is a good way to look at these things, is to look at uh, hydrogen inside the pipe. Okay, so how do we keep it inside the pipe? Or what does our design mean for, for that? Uh, actually, what happens uh, on loss of containment? So what it, what, how do we stop it coming out? Uh, and then we look at hydrogen outside the pipe to say, okay, right, we accept it's going to come out. What if it does? How do we uh, design our infrastructure to, to cope with hydrogen outside the pipe? And of course, this, uh, this lovely diagram um, on the right is a very simple version of the famous Swiss cheese model, so-called because these look like slices of Swiss cheese. So we have uh, the cause of the event here, um, and we have our layers of protection, which are never perfect, when the imperfections are uh, indicated by the holes. Uh, and when those holes line up, then the initiating event becomes an incident. Okay, and these layers of protection are things like um, uh, correct material choice to keep it inside the pipe, uh, and then it could be um, hydrogen detection and shut-off system uh, as a second layer of protection, for example. Okay, it's only when you've chosen the, or it's only when the, the hole here lines up with the hole here that those two things have failed, uh, and therefore we, we have a problem. Okay, so let's talk about hydrogen inside the pipe. And what, what we're really thinking about here is um, pre prevention of leaks as, as best we can uh, and the phenomena of embrittlement. Uh, we, we talked about uh, the increased leakage rate as a result of the molecular size. So yes, um, many, many, many people are starting to think about how they're going to get all this hydrogen around the, the country and around the world. And we're looking at um, existing pipelines to do that. Um, so what is your existing pipeline made of? Uh, and is it compatible with the phenomenon uh, with the, with hydrogen, and will it resist embrittlement in the uh, in the pressure and temperature uh, that you're choosing to use? Well, that that's that, that's a thing that needs to be thought about. It's obviously a difficult job because uh, pipelines tend to be quite long, so there's a lot, a lot of work to think about there. Um, <clears throat> so you'll notice these pipes here are outside, which which is nice, um, and that, that's where they need to be because hydrogen permeation is possible through the material itself. Okay, so that, that's, that's what I want there. Okay, so re really when we're talking about um, hydrogen inside the pipe, we want to make sure that we've chosen uh, the right material uh, given the temperature and pressure and other uh, parameters of our intended operation. Okay, there are other factors such as uh, reduction of joints, uh, the right kind of valves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But fundamentally, we, we do need to make choices to keep it in as best we can. But what what actually happens um, when it when it comes out? So let's let's say it's going to come out because it will at some point. Okay, so we, we've got this um, this phenomenon where it heats up as it expands. So if you think about hydrogen in a in a in a bottle, for example, uh, the the air is bigger than the bottle, so the, the gas expands and there's, there's some heat involved. And so, you know, we, we are thinking about uh, whether that temperature rise can lead to the hydrogen 
can reach the hydrogen auto ignition temperature. Uh, and you know, we see on the left here, we've got a chart. Auto ignition temperature of hydrogen is 1,085 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not vastly different to, to that of natural gas, but of course, uh, natural gas uh, doesn't get hot as it expands. Okay, uh, and, and then we've got some other gases down here, which which obviously the uh, the auto ignition temperature decreases as we as we go to the right. Uh, but of significantly more interest uh, in terms of the change of risk profile uh, is this graph on the right, which shows us that uh, the ignition energy of hydrogen, which I touched on previously, uh, it is very low, uh, a, a, a factor of 10 at least between hydrogen and natural gas. So it's going to come out and it's therefore going to be ignited unless you do something with it. Okay, so put point. 0.02 millijoules, we're talking st static, uh, small static discharge, uh, and also uh, potentially um, the static generated by dust in the released hydrogen. Okay, so that, that's the sort of thing that we're worried about. So there's clearly um, a vast change in risk profile when we talk about the loss of containment of hydrogen and the small ignition energy required to ignite it. Okay, right, so what, once it is outside, um, what, what, what happens actually? So it, it, is, it is lightweight, okay? So um, it, the, the buoyancy of it lends itself well to the dissipation. Uh, and of course it'll only dissipate if it doesn't ignite in the first place. Uh, and then there's all sorts of, of research happening to determine what the actual um, uh, dissipation cloud looks like, and what, what the ignition energy actually is. A lot of theory, but uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, empirical evidence required to, uh, to fully understand it. And there's so many variables uh, that it's, uh, it's a constant source of, uh, of effort to keep on top of all that. Um, so yes, whilst, whilst it does dissipate, it perhaps doesn't dissipate uniformly and the, uh, the, the, the momentum of the gas cloud, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is, is, a, is an important factor in that. Uh, you know, it, it, there's basically uh, a high chance of a delay before the dissipation is sufficient to reach a level below what we call the, the lower flammability limit. Okay, so the, the table on the left here gives examples. So flammability range of hydrogen is four to 75% by volume uh, compared with uh, methanol, um, methane, propane and gasoline that, that's a that's a long that's a lot of scope so all that hydrogen that's come out of your uh, thousand kilometers of pipeline um, needs to dissipate to either below four percent by volume or above 75 percent by volume in order to uh, not ignite uh, so we, we see pictorially on the right the, the the difference i think that i think the graph on the right shows it better uh, than the numbers so uh, we can see, I think that's about 4% down there uh, and that's about 75% up there compared to that of natural gas, which is, which is about what, five to 15%. And that the bar there uh, provides this, the stoichiometric ratio, which is um, a thing where that, that's the, the mixture of hydrogen in air where all the fuel is consumed, i.e. That, that's the biggest bang uh, and potentially also that's where the lowest amount of energy required for ignition uh, is placed. So uh, either side of that bar, uh, you need either more or less. Um, sorry, no, I, I apologize, I made a mistake there. Either side of that bar, you need uh, more energy in order to ignite the, the changing um, ratio of hydrogen in air. There's a, there's a curve to follow that, okay. So hopefully that that shows uh, the, the difference in the um, and and can be used effectively to to really understand the, uh, the again the, the changing risk profile of hydrogen. Okay, that, 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 that at the end of the day is the, the, the thrust of this presentation. Okay, so what what we often use um, for risk management is this style of analysis called bowtie analysis. Uh, bowtie analysis looks at uh, threats on the left uh, in the blue, 
Uh, these gray boxes are our barriers. Okay, then we look at the, the top event, actually what, what may happen, that's the hazard. Uh, and then we go to the right and we look at the mitigating effects and ultimately the consequence. Okay, so on the left, it, it's good to think is inside the pipe, uh, loss of containment, which is the hazard is in the middle and outside the pipe uh, is the consequence. Uh, and then what we have to do really is we have to know what these uh, barriers and mitigating factors are. Okay, so that's the, that's the analysis. That's what we're looking at. But what we really need to do is assign descriptions to each of these. Okay, so what actually do we need to think about when we are populating our bow tie analysis for a hydrogen system in order to demonstrate that our risk is reduced to a tolerable level. So let's have a look. Okay. So as a minimum, first thing we need to think about is what our international and domestic regulations and standards are. They will give us um, a, a good guide as to what we need to think about um, and what we need to look at and the activities we need to carry out in order to fully understand the risk that we are dealing with. Uh, standards nowadays are starting to look uh, at a, at a risk-based approach. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and ra rather than a prescriptive approach. So uh, you, you, you could look in here to see what you're required to do that they won't give you a solution as to how you do it. Okay, so we, we need to be looking at our design requirements for pressure vessels, if we're using pressure vessels, which we probably are. Uh, what are our design requirements for pipelines, valves, compressors? Uh, for storage media, transportation, all, all these things uh, are either part of our system or interface to our system. Uh, and that we need to ask our design teams and we need to ask of our design and we need to assess our design to make sure that we know all the parameters required uh, to, to, to make sure that the design requirements are relevant and correct. But there are uh, a number of uh, existing hydrogen hazard control measures. Uh, for example, if you uh, are working on hydrogen systems uh, for a, uh, a, a high hazard industry uh, company, probably you have uh, known hazards and preferred methods of control, uh, and, and they should be uh, understood. They should be researched and they should be uh, em employed uh, where relevant and appropriate given the parameters of your system, okay? Uh, touched on uh, material compatibility. Um, is, your, is your material compatible with hydrogen at the operating parameters uh, that you are choosing to use? Now, are there any interfacing systems which need to be modified in order to be able to operate your hydrogen system safely? So for, for example, uh, co coolant systems, um, firefighting systems, is there anything that can uh, have uh, an effect, anything that can be impacted uh, by uh, the hydrogen system, given the potential for hydrogen to leak? Okay, so we're talking um, about making sure that you have removed your sources of ignition. Okay, so what else? Once it's outside the pipe, right? Okay, well, we've got we've got to detect it. Okay, so the, the picture on the bottom, I've, <laughs> I've said it's, I said you can't see it, but for all intents and purposes, who knows what that gas is coming out of there? That could just be condensation. Okay, so uh, you can't rely on you can't rely on seeing it to detect it. So we need to make sure that we have the right kind of detection probes in place. Okay, and again, it comes down to the, the parameters of the operation. OK, um, and there's also a need to take executive action on detection. So actually, what do we do once once we have detected it? Uh, do we incorporate it into the fire alarm system? Do we have a separate system? Does our existing fire alarm system uh, cope with what we are required to do on detection of hydrogen? Again, questions to ask of our design. Uh, so. <clears throat> Next, we, we need to think about ignition control. Okay, so oh, it's out there. Okay, it's come out of the pipe. Uh, what we need to do is not ignite it. 
and we need to make sure that uh, we have done our hazardous area um, classification. Uh, hazardous area. We've divided our plants up into to areas uh, so we know that uh, there is a risk of hydrogen being in the environment in a particular place and that any um, potential sources of ignition are either suitable for that environment or removed completely because removal of sources is obviously the best way to go. Um, well, let's let, well, I'm going to assume that we've got lighting. So you know, we, we, if we've accepted that we're going to have hydrogen, is the lighting system compatible with hydrogen? Uh, and is the fire protection system uh, also compatible? Are there any potential um, sources of ignition in there, in there at all? Uh, and an ignition source control, if you detect it, do you, shut, uh, do you shut off your electricity supply? Do you remove your ignition source? Is there anything besides electrical components which could be cause, causes of ignition? Um, we talked about the low ignition energy uh, and um, earthing and bonding therefore becomes a layer of protection uh, and, a, and a barrier uh, to, uh, to static discharge, et cetera. Uh, another thing to think about. So if, if we do have components in the, uh, in the area where the gas may be, then we need to make sure we see this little sign uh, and the various other uh, indicators on the component to make sure that it's suitable for a hydrogen environment. So it's all very well looking at our system, but what about our building? So I said when we were looking at the uh, pictures that uh, we have design decisions that could have been made to pre prevent the amount of destruction. Well, we need to be thinking about ventilation design. Let, let's make sure we get plenty of air changes. Let's get let's get lots of fresh air in there. Uh, wh where where's the make where's the fresh air come from, and where does the dirty air go to? Uh, there, there are things that we can do from an active and passive isolation point of view, so it, we can detect explosion and make executive uh, choices uh, automatically to to mitigate the effects of it. Um, and then we've got this idea of uh, the installation and design being obviously different activities. It's all very well having it designed, but is it installed correctly? Uh, are there any things that we can do? Is there any means of uh, explosion prevention by what we call deflagration venting and pressure relief? So uh, do we have blast walls in place? Can we direct a blast upwards? Uh, in which case we may be able to minimize the uh, amount of damage to the facility. Uh, and then uh, fire protection and fire resistance requirements. So what does that mean in terms of the building design? We can have all the detection we like uh, on our system, and we can have all the shutoffs and things that we, that, we, that we think we need in our system. But if the building is not designed for hydrogen systems, or if we don't have the opportunity to, to change the design of the building, uh, then we've, uh, we've missed uh, an important um, mitigating barrier. And of course, if we remember the Illinois example where there were uh, hazardous substances co-located, we have to ask whether our new hydrogen system is co-located uh, near any other substances which, which may be flammable, because we certainly don't want uh, multiple um, disasters on our hands. Okay, uh, and then many times uh, safety uh, and management uh, and operation are entwined. Uh, so so we, we need to make sure that uh, supervision requirements for hydrogen systems are known if there are any changes, which, which there should be. Um, you know, we, can, we can think about what additional supervision measures we may want to employ over and above what we've seen previously. Um, <clears throat> maintenance and inspection. So, okay, are all our um, uh, clear, fresh air filters clear? Do we have the flow rate? Is everything working as it should? When was the last time we checked the fire system? Uh, do all the hydrogen detectors work, uh, et cetera? And, and you know, it's people we're talking about. So let's let's think about the difference between um, the personnel requirements for uh, standard oil and gas infrastructure, uh, infrastructure um, team uh, and what they now need to be able to do for a hydrogen system. The, the classic example uh, is 
uh, when uh, buses uh, are converted to, when bus fleets are converted to hydrogen, uh, there's decades and decades of experience in uh, maintaining and, and refueling diesel buses. Uh, but as soon as we want to go green and have a nice fleet of hydrogen buses, uh, which is great, um, are those maintenance skills and is that competence in maintaining diesel buses relevant in a hydrogen environment? So we have to be able to train people in order to, uh, to carry out their, their same duties in a safe way in the new environment. Uh, same applies to the temporary staff, delivery drivers. Uh, do, do, you, do you earth your lorry before you connect your hydrogen refueler? You should do. Um, there are hazards which these people are exposed to, which they need to be aware of. So signage and things is required. And the last line of defense uh, for, for any risk management activity is, is, and people is, is PPE. So once we've exhausted all our options for influencing design um, and ma managing safety by design, then what are our PPE requirements for our uh, new hydrogen operation? And I, I don't have the answers. I don't have the answers to that, uh, but we need to certainly ask the question as to whether we need to reinvest in that level. Um, and the, the, the properties uh, of hydrogen and the, uh, the, the things we've talked about, such as uh, the, the low radiated heat uh, and, and things, um, as a result of hydrogen fires, we, we need to brief the emergency response people. We need to brief the fire brigade. We need to tell them what we've got and how they are to respond should there be an incident on our new site. Um, that, and I, I don't think that there will be a fire brigade in the land or an emergency team in the land who wouldn't agree with that. They certainly don't want to go to a fire only to find there's hydrogen leaking and not have the tools uh, or, the, or the experience or knowledge to know how to shut it off. Okay, so I think uh, the, the last point, of course, uh, and so this is something that will be no doubt familiar to anyone from a high hazard industry, um, and that is the need to communicate the risks that we've identified. Okay, so this, this small example here is uh, an extract of what we would call a hazard log, or, or a, in this case, a hazard record, interchangeable really. So this, this is a, a record of all the hazards that we've identified. Uh, and the you'll see down here that the risk that that hazard uh, is, is presenting to people. Okay, now uh, I'll stress that this is not an example from a, an existing system. This is an example from a make-believe system. Uh, but what it shows is that uh, we have two hazards that we've identified that we're going to talk about. Uh, hydrogen, embr hydrogen embrittlement is a hazard uh, caused by material selection. The consequence is leakage. Uh, it's likely to happen, and if it leaks, we're, li we, we're likely to have a fatality, and therefore the risk is high. Uh, the safeguards are that we've selected the right kind of material for our um, operation, and we are having a regular inspection regime. And the actions uh, over and above that uh, are to ensure that embrittlement is considered in the design criteria, which it will be to, to select the material, and that the inspection regime is in line with what the material properties are. And if we do that, then whilst the severity is still fatal and high, uh, it's therefore unlikely that we will have a hydrogen leak. And you can see the risk is reduced from high to medium, given what we know. OK, so, so what, what this really gives us is, is a method of um, recording that we have identified issues. Uh, it gives us a method of recording that we have uh, analysed the issue and that we think we know um, why our residual risk is the level it's at. OK, and we, we can use that to, uh, to communicate the risks across the business and to make sure that we track that through the life of the project. OK, it provides a, a traceability, uh, which is important. So, uh, right, you know, if, if, if we had an accident, uh, Your Honour, uh, then I'm very sorry, but we, we had a uh, design um, criteria to look at the material spe specification, and that's what we chose, and that's why we chose the material that we chose. Uh, so, so we can trace back to decisions made for risk reduction. 
Um, and yes, as, as I say, it shows the risk before and after mitigations. Right, we're nearly at time, so I'm going to uh, conclude uh, by saying that we, we need to expect hydrogen to have widespread adoption. Okay, I've spoken to a number of people who say you know, interest in hydrogen peaks every so many years. Uh, and there's also a, a number of people that are saying uh, the time is now. So let's go forward into the hydrogen economy. Uh, let's take it on. Uh, but let, let's do it, bearing in mind the change in risk, the change in risk profile. Uh, let's have a tolerable level of risk. Um, let's recognize these specific characteristics that affect the risk profile. Uh, but fear not, uh, there are existing risk management techniques. They are effective. Uh, we know about them. Uh, we know about how to keep hydrogen safe. We just need to be able to actually do it. We need to be able to influence design and avoid over-engineering. And we have a nice example in the picture of a hydrogen-powered camper van, um, which uh, I thought would be uh, a, a good example of <laughs> so something that contains a bit of a bit of cooking, a bit of heating, and a bit of entertainment as well. So, okay, that is the end of my presentation. I hope it's been interesting. And I'll hand you back to Steve Lewis uh, for the Q and A. That's great, Nick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a number of questions that have come in. Um, so let's let's uh, start going through those. But uh, if you'd like to ask a question, then you just use that Q and A function uh, at, the bottom, at the bottom of your page there. Okay, first question from Matthew. Am I correct in thinking that hydrogen would need a safe method of transport for use? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, so so you know, it, it, uh, absolutely. There's the uh, it would depend upon the, the means by which you are transporting it. Uh, but it is, uh, I think, subject to something in, in the UK, at least, or in Europe, the, uh, I think it's called tra Transportation Pressure Equipment Directive. Uh, if, if it's under pressure, then you need to look at what we call TPED. And it, it would be essential to do some kind of risk assessment in order to make sure that any risks, the transportation element of your uh, operation uh, it, uh, generates are, are managed and identified. So, so yes. Okay, thank you. Question from Yanis: Which sector? Sorry, which sector of the hydrogen economy uh, do you think today is mature enough to be able to implement it fully? Um, and what are the main barriers? Perhaps technical, financial, something else. Right. Okay. That, 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 that's a great question. Um, I'll <clears throat> the, the main barriers. Uh, let, let's, let's you know, safety is all very well, but uh, we don't have anything without finance, do we? And I, I think uh, one of the main barriers uh, at, at this point in time uh, is the that the money's there, that the political will is there, uh, but the the decision as to whether to concentrate on uh, infrastructure or products uh, is is still unknown. Okay, so 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 really, you know, it, it's it's a bit chicken and egg, I would say. So in terms of the, the barriers to wide scale deployment, uh, people need to take a gamble, put some money into everything, <laughs> which is a little bit pie in the sky. Um, but but fundamentally, uh, I think that the barrier to wide scale adoption is that it's not clear where the biggest business benefit will be. So certainly you can't have um, a, a hydrogen sports car without hydrogen refueling. But why would anyone invest in hydrogen refueling if no one's got a hydrogen sports car, for example? So, so then there needs to be some kind of um, decision made in the world as to where the money ought to go first. So I think... Yeah, the, 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 the barrier to wide scale adoption could be uh, political direction. And, but I'm following that logic then. So I mean, if, if the finances were there, I mean, is there a sector that's mature enough to just implement today? Here's the money. Uh, so, Off yeah, goes. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So uh, we are seeing any number of, um, for example, uh, public transport um, organizations adopting uh, hydrogen. Uh, for for example for buses yeah 
So, so yeah, yeah, uh, hydrogen to power um, public transport uh, is currently mature enough for wide scale adoption, I would say. Okay, great question from Matthew. Um, before using natural gas, uh, was the UK set up to use hydrogen? Ah, I, I, gasometers. I, you said. <laughs> uh, uh, I wasn't around <laughs> uh, at, at that point, uh, but um, I sense potentially a trick question in this one. Um, with respect, I I believe that uh, hydrogen was a component of uh, the predecessor to natural gas. Yep. So, so I, I think the answer is yes, uh, but the world's moved on. Uh, and so any, any credit that we had from those days needs to be generated again, I think. Okay, there's a question from John, um, recognizing that hydrogen's got such a low uh, ignition energy. Um, how close is ignition on discharge due to a loss of process containment not an inevitability right uh, okay um i would say that for the purposes of assessment and design choices you should assume ignition it, it, it's difficult to answer with, with any kind of figures yeah. uh, but but we, uh, when when doing risk assessment for hydrogen systems we would assume ignition will take place on loss of containment. Okay, there's a follow-on question from John. Uh, we used to put toroidal rings in uh, pressure safety valve discharges to atmosphere in hydrogen surface years ago to mitigate static. Um, do you know how effective these are? Got a specific question. Uh, um, no, I, uh, I. I don't know. Uh, if, if they reduce static, then great. It's better than nothing. Uh, but if, if that technology is old, I, I suspect it's either been improved or replaced by something else. Okay, a uh, question from Ian. What's the conventional wisdom around a vapor cloud explosion from cryogenic hydrogen storage? While gaseous hydrogen may disperse rapidly, Cryogenic liquid hydrogen is a different thing entirely. Uh, yes, yes, it, it is. But uh, liquid liquid hydrogen is uh, very cold, uh, and if it's out in the in the wild, um, I believe that it would evaporate and therefore form a gas. In which case, we're looking at gaseous hydrogen. Yeah, in which case, there's a potential for a vapor cloud explosion. Uh, I guess. Yeah, I, I think I think so, um, so but I'm, I'm I'm no expert on liquid yeah. hydrogen. Yeah, okay, no worries. Uh, question from Ben: um, Have you developed a detailed bowtie model uh, for loss of containment of hydrogen? And is that the top event? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we've done we've done uh, detailed bow ties for hydrogen systems. Uh, loss of containment is uh, one of the top events. Okay, question from David. Um, many pipes are underground. Is it really feasible to use underground pipelines, I guess, for hydrogen? Uh, uh, right now, uh, I, I don't see why not. Um, but don't hold me to that. I, I would have to do some kind of assessment on the uh, pr pressures, temperatures, and composition of the material uh, and uh, of the gas inside it, uh, in order to fully answer. I, th I think the, the answer is it depends on context. Uh, I, 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 I don't see why you wouldn't, but you wouldn't be able to perhaps detect leakage outside other than by pressure drop. So, what's the impact of leaked hydrogen on the the substrate around the pipe? Interesting question. Um, immediately, I, I, I don't see why not, uh, but there may be industrial convention uh, against it. Or certainly, uh, it would, I think, be better to have it in open air to, to make sure that any amount leaked is dissipated rather than stored in the air gaps around the pipe. Great. A question from Mark. What do you think of the main gaps in safety? Uh, maybe the society doesn't understand for the hydrogen economy? 
Uh, whew, crikey, yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, let, let, let's, let's think about that, first of all, in terms of, you know, as, as an example, let's think about that in terms of vehicles. Okay, so, so at, at the moment, we're quite happily driving around with uh, 50 litres of petrol in the boot of our car. Okay, and we go to the petrol pump, and if I wanted to, I could squirt it all over the floor. Yeah. Okay, um, so so we, we accept that risk, and we live with that risk on a daily basis. Uh, from a hydrogen point of view, you know, if if you 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 wouldn't be able to release the hydrogen into the air, that the systems wouldn't allow it, um, and it certainly wouldn't leak onto the floor; it'd just go into the air. Okay, so um, the, so we've got an immediate recognition of the the change in risk profile and you know, the the knowledge of the the general public in that context um is is the thing to think about however um the the, the key element i think i think i'm waffling a bit sorry <laughs> sorry um really there's there's a lot of there's a lot of headline Pe people know it as the, the the most combustible gas in the universe which is fair it is uh but uh, people perhaps don't know it as highly diffusible, uh, e easily um, dispersed, and 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 very light. So so let's let's not let's let's recognise the combustibility, uh, but let's also not recognise it in isolation. Let's recognise it along with um, other features. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's a really good answer. Um... Nick, thanks. And and in fact, the next question kind of follows exactly the same theme uh, that you, you were taking on there. It's a question from uh, Theo. He says that uh, society's attitudes to fuel are in general quite relaxed. Think of cars, petrol, diesel, propane, which is exactly the point you were making. Um, however, hydrogen is treated much more cautiously when actually it is simply just another fuel that needs to be correctly managed and maintained. Why do you think this is the case? And do you think it is the role of key leaders, risk managers, risk managers in industry, to level the playing field to ensure hydrogen is as widely used as possible, in a way that's not constricted by safety measures. Yeah, I, 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 I don't. To be honest, I don't think that the I, I haven't seen anywhere where people are um, against hydrogen on safety grounds. I, I see people against it on the grounds of cost and on the grounds of technology um, uptake, et cetera. Uh, but I, I think as long as the green credentials are um, well known uh, and the general public is at least cognizant of the, um, the, the safety issues and that industry who, who deploy systems that handle uh, hydrogen are cognizant of the safety issues, um, then I, 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 I don't really think that we've got a problem. And I don't. I, I think we need to just keep going as we are. Good. And uh, do you think um, any public perception of hydrogen is perhaps tainted by the Hindenburg disaster, which is the which is the normal disaster people roll out when they're talking about uh, hydrogen accidents? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. But I, I, to be honest, I think that's. That's, that's a long time ago now, uh, and I, I would say that uh, you know, the, the, the benefits outweigh the, uh, the potential consequences given the technology that we have at our disposal. So I, I purposely have avoided reference to, to Hindenburg uh, <laughs> because I, it's, you know, I'm not saying it didn't happen, uh, but there's a lot more that we can learn from other incidents. Uh, and in fact, in, in the slide pack there, uh, there's a link uh, on the same slides, uh, on the same slide as the photographs, uh, which takes us to a, a document um, which gives us a whole rundown of incidents where hydrogen has been a factor. Uh, and it's, it's a really good document to be. There's a lot of lessons that can be learned from that. So, yeah, don't 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 think Hindenburg uh, think everything else. Very good. Uh Question from Gaurav, will it be possible to liquefy hydrogen for better transportation or could it only uh, be compressed through pipelines? Yeah, so 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 um, hydrogen is uh, gaseous until very cold and the energy required to, to make it liquid um, is is a lot. Uh, you know, what, what actually is the likely way to go is that it will be transported as ammonia 
and then that ammonia will be cracked into hydrogen uh, on location. So at the moment, there's a lot of uh, tube trailers. Uh, there's a lot of talk of tube trailers uh, taking hydrogen from point A to point B, and there's special ships and things like that that are being built. Um, but you know, ammonia uh, is it's it's dangerous, but it's it's not got the same properties as hydrogen. So we'll we'll be carrying ammonia, and we'll be turning that ammonia into hydrogen uh, when when it's required. Okay, a couple more questions. A uh, question from John Ju. With the reverse Joule Thomson effect, would compressing hydrogen absorb heat and put additional temperature stress on top of embrittlement caused by diffusion into metal? Uh, <laughs> um, I will. Uh, I'll defer to the court of Wikipedia <laughs> uh, for, for that. So I'm afraid my. Uh, I, 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 it, to avoid giving an incorrect answer, I, I'll just simply hold my hand up and say that I, I, I don't know the answer to that, I'm afraid. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and then the last question from Matthew, uh, what's the most efficient production of hydrogen? Uh, would it be green or, or blue? Uh, and maybe you uh, wanted to say a little bit what, what what's the difference yeah, between green okay, and blue okay, for people okay. who don't, don't understand that. Uh, okay, so uh, when we talk about hydrogen production, we have green hydrogen, which comes from renewable sources. So a green hydrogen is, for example, something where you have a wind farm, a wind farm electricity is sent in, well, the, the unused electricity from a wind farm is sent into a, an electrolyzer plant and that electrolyzer generates hydrogen. That, that's classic green hydrogen. Um, it's, it's entirely renewable. Uh, but blue hydrogen is where we've used, for example, fossil fuels uh, to generate the hydrogen, but where we have stripped the carbon dioxide out of it. Okay, and we've stored the carbon dioxide somewhere. Uh, and what we get out of it is, is blue hydrogen. And then gray hydrogen uh, is where we've just made it from um, fossil fuels. Uh, it's not renewable in any stretch. And unfortunately, that's, that's the majority of hydrogen production in the world right now. So uh, that's, that's a bit about the cause. Can you just repeat the question, please? So what's the most efficient production of hydrogen? green or blue uh efficient in terms of yes power in power out and energy and energy out uh, I, I i think probably the electrolyzer yeah yeah okay well thanks very much uh nick yeah did a really good job on those questions uh, we need to wrap up now uh so we will make a recording available uh to everybody who's listening uh, later this week uh, when you leave the webinar, you should receive a survey in your browser. Appreciate it if you take, just take a, a, a moment to complete that, because we really do appreciate your feedback. Uh, if you've got any questions uh, or you want any further information, then uh, please uh, simply email us. Um, I think you saw email. Uh, you saw Nick's uh, email address in uh, one of the earlier slides. Or you can just go on our, our website, ristech.tv.com. Uh, and there's a contact form pretty much on every page there where you can just uh, fill in fill in the form, send it to us, and we'll, we'll get back to you. Okay, so thank you, Nick, once again, and thank you, everybody, for your attention. Uh, really grateful for you to taking the time out of your busy schedules to uh, be with us today. Uh, the next webinar, in fact, is the last webinar in this current series, is next Wednesday, 27th of April. So that's a week today, uh, kickoff time, 3 p.m. UK, so same time. Same time, same place next week. Um, and it's about the design safety process for offshore wind farms. So hopefully you can join us for that one too. Uh, in the meantime, please stay safe and stay secure and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.